Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon. I welcome you to our session um, under the thematic stream of rebuilding dispute settlement. Uh, we have an amazing lineup of speakers for rock stars and I'll briefly introduce each one of them as I call them to our discussion. Since the beginning, I would like to invite you all to type your questions in the Q&A chat box. Uh, we have a guiding question for our discussion in the second part of the session, and we are planning to have around 30 to 40 minutes to address your questions at the end of the session. So what can be done to rebuild the WTO dispute settlement system, and what might such a system look like? The WTO dispute settlement system faces an unprecedented crisis. Although the short-term reason for this crisis is the blockage of the appoint in the appointment of the of appellate body members, uh, its causes are much older, numerous, and not limited to legal aspects related to the functioning of the dispute settlement pillar. Solutions proposed to date have mainly focused on panel proceedings and the functioning of the appellate body itself. While these are obviously important elements, it is necessary to think beyond the contribution of specific bodies or procedures already in place and reconsider the dispute settlement function in a rules-based trading system. Well before the current appellate body impasse, panels and the appellate body were already working beyond their capacity as the number of cases and their complexity grew. Isn't this crisis a unique opportunity to reflect on the WTO dispute settlement outside the box? This means improving panels and appellate review, but also thinking about the settlement of dispute in a more holistic manner. This session will discuss ways of revigorating the dispute settlement pillar beyond simply adjudication. So I have some suggested questions for our uh, speakers, and uh, I would uh, to first ask Valeria um, about something that I, I think she she can uh, set up this this scenario for our discussion. So. Valeria Mendes Costa is a Brazilian diplomat currently posted in Brazil. Her work is now focused on investment agreement negotiations and dispute settlement. From 2008 to mid 2018, Valeria was in charge of WTO dispute settlement at the General Coordination for Dispute Settlement in the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in the Brazilian Mission to the WTO in Geneva. She also has a master's degree on international dispute settlement. So, Valeria, to start our conversation in this session, in our, your view, uh, what does it mean to think the WTO dispute resolution function in a different way, in a holistic manner? Valeria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Renata. It is a pleasure for me to work in the, to, to participate in the Geneva Trade Week. Before I start, I'd like to make a disclaimer. I'm not speaking today on an official basis as a Brazilian diplomat, but in my personal capacity. Well, having said that, this panel invites us to think the WTO dispute resolution function in a holistic manner. What does it mean? Well, for me, it means to think the dispute resolution function in a broader, in a more comprehensive, in a more integrated manner. Dispute resolution in international trade has evolved from a more diplomatic uh, means of solving disputes to a highly legalized and judicialized system. WTO members have not only developed, put in place a detailed set of rules and procedures to solve their disputes, but they have also foreseen a very efficient enforcement mechanism like any other international uh, dispute resolution system. But I think that in view of this evolution and also as part of it, a culture of litigation has predominated in the WTO, at least this is my opinion. The, the former DG, Roberto Azevedo, mentioned in a speech to the DSB in 2015, October 2015, that in the early days, most disputes involved a challenge to a single measure 
and only three or four claims. In 2015, each dispute involved an average of 28 measures and 180 claims. So in other words, with the legalization of the process, the judicialization of disputes also became the rule in the W2. I'm not making a judgment about the appropriateness of this evolution. And um, I think that despite all the, the problems and the criticisms that the dispute settlement mechanism, uh, that we can make to the dispute settlement mechanism, I think it has proved its value, right? My point is simply to say that we, from my perspective, we have lost sight of, of a broader perspective uh, when thinking about dispute resolution at the WTO. Because in terms of procedures, we have been too much focused on adjudicating disputes by panels and the appellate body. And we have forgotten to make use of other tools to prevent disputes and to solve them, right? I think we have also lost sight that different actors, actors are involved in this process. We have the parties, we have the panelists, the appellate body, but we also have the private stakeholders. We have the WHO secretariat, we have the DG, we have the committees. So the question that I pose myself is, should we not rethink their roles in the dispute settlement process? If I have to put this question differently, can the DG, the panelists, the committees and the WHO members themselves do more than they do today to help preventing and solving disputes? I, I think that there is much room for improvement, right? And I think that we should put light on other forms of dispute resolution and specifically on dispute prevention, right? And rethink the, the, the whole of all actors involved in this process. I have some ideas of how we can, we can do that, how we can strengthen the dispute settlement function, right? Broadly speaking. And uh, some of them involve uh, thinking the current modus operandi in a new way, and others are outside the context of a formal dispute, right? I'll, I'll, today I'll just make six brief suggestions. First, um, I think we should make more effective use of consultations. I think consultations have proved their value. It's commonly accepted that they have served their purpose, but sometimes consultations are a pro forma step. They are a compulsory passage that the parties cross while already thinking in the subsequent judicial steps. One evidence of me, one evidence of this for me is the presence of lawyers in the consultations room, right? The other evidence, I'm not saying that lawyers are not necessary, but the fact is that they are in the room, right? And, and they, they operate in a litigation board. The other evidence is the number of claims. And a third evidence is the lack, sometimes the lack of quality of the dialogue between the parties during consultations. It's not uncommon, Renata, to see that, to hear many evasive answers during consultations, right? Sometimes some members simply refer the, the, the complainant to a website page where, where the complainant can find the answers. So the parties don't really engage in a real dialogue in consultations, right? And the problem is that consultations are, in fact, the first step within a formal dispute. So what could be done? I think that a way of improving consultations could be to have a third party, a third neutral person involved in this person, in this process, to serve as a facilitator or even mediator between the parties. Let's, let's not forget that when the parties come to consultations, they have already talked for months trying to solve the dispute, right? So simply put them together in a room to talk again. I some, Sometimes it, it produces good results, but many times don't. So I, I think it's necessary to change the dynamics of the interaction and the involvement of facilitator or mediation in the consultation process, helping the parties to engage would be very, uh, very positive. Second, I think that panels should have a more active role in promoting settlement, right? In, in helping the parties to reach a settlement. Uh, it is true that the terms of reference of panels are to examine the matter before them. But Article 11 of the DSU states that panels should consult regularly with the parties and, and give them adequate opportunity to develop a mutually satisfactory solution. Or panels have a role in encouraging negotiation between the parties. But Despite this guidance, 
timetables do not envisage, envisage such moment and panelists do not engage in such exercise, right? So what could be done? Maybe the rules of conduct and the working procedures for the dispute could have provisions guiding the panelists on how to perform this task. Another way of encouraging is to foresee in the timetable a moment for the parties to consult. For example, such a meeting could take place after the second hearing. At, at this stage of the process, the panelists and the parties have a good idea of the outcome of the dispute, right? The winning party may want to push to have a report, but the, complaint, but the respondent may, may find in this initiative an opportunity to settle, right? I think that another opportunity to have such a meeting is when the interim report is circulated to the parties. Third, I think we should make better use of good offices conciliation and mediation, first and foremost, before a dispute arises, but also within a dispute, right? Before a dispute, because it's better to mediate an irritant than to mediate a dispute, right? The SPS committee is the sole body in the WTO that has developed a mediation mechanism. And to my knowledge, this mechanism has never been used. Switzerland proposed in 2019 to extend mediation to other WTO bodies, but the discussions did not progress. So I think that an assessment should be made of why mediation has not been more frequently used in the WTO and how it could be improved and eventually extended to other committees. Would it be valuable? to have a mediation center in the WTO? Why don't we have a deal, real discussion on that? There are disputes and disputes. Some of them may not be amenable to, to fit into a mediation process, but others may. So in, in any case, I'm convinced and that mediation can at least help to limit the scope of disputes. Good offices conciliation and mediation could also be used as a complementary tool when a dispute is already going on. I have mentioned the mediated consultations, but there are other opportunities as well. Professor Pauling and Zhang have a study where they explain that around one in four disputes have required a compliance proceeding. proceedings. In other words, members have litigated disputes about measures that have already been found inconsistent. So a mediator or some kind of neutral third party intervention could help the parties to better understand the reports. And, it, and, it's, and it's, sometimes they are not very clear, and to adopt measures that could implement those reports satisfactorily. Fourth, I think that the member-driven culture should change, in my personal view. What I mean by that? I mean that the fact that the WTO is a member-driven organization should not prevent the WTO to propose discussions when members are not able to propose themselves. Of course, I'm not proposing the WTO to encroach on, on members' rights, but I think that the WTO could do more to raise topics that may be of interest to the membership. There are different ways to invite members to think about new topics. Maybe I'm underestimating the work done so far by the WTO, but I think that the WTO could work as a laboratory of new ideas, including in the split segment. Fifth, I think we should encourage discussions uh, while things can still be resolved. In this sense, more transparency and guidance from uh, and guidance regarding the elaboration of domestic trade measures is an important element to prevent disputes. Wow. The TBT agreement uh, contains obligation to notify measures at an early appropriate stage. Uh, this explains the success of the STCs in the TBT. Uh, I'm not going to extend too much on this because I think that Mariana will, will speak about it, but I just want to say that even though other WTO agreements do not foresee the obligation to notify a measure before it enters into force, nothing prevents the WTO committees to recommend members to act in this way, right? So more transparency, more guidance and recommendations on matters covered by each committee could be useful as well. A measure sometimes is, is inconsistent with an agreement for lack of expertise of the domestic authorities. Finally, a, a culture of cooperation and dialogue should somehow be cultivated uh, in, all, in all instances of the WTO in every possible moment, including in the negotiation of new rules. Uh, I have the impression that when members negotiate new agreements, they are already thinking of a possible future dispute. 
it is important to think the trade rules under the perspective of dispute prevention and of cooperation between governments. In the negotiation of new agreements, why members do not include mechanisms incentivizing more cooperation, more dialogue between governments before a dispute arises? Provisions on good offices, conciliation, and mediation could also uh, be included uh, as a first step before bringing a dispute. In sum, there is much room for improving the, the dispute settlement function in the WTO. Although panels and the appellate body are an essential feature of this system, I think that a myriad of other actions and tools could be implemented with a view to divert issues from advocacy education, improve cooperation towards the resolution of a trade function. Thank you, Renata. Excellent remarks, Valeria. Thank you for uh, for bringing so much uh, elements for our discussion. Uh, I'm sure we are going to go back on transparency, and I definitely want to hear more on mediation. Uh, but now there is one specific point that you mentioned in the beginning of your talk, uh, which is about the different stakeholders involved in a dispute. So, with regards to that specifically, I would really like to hear. Uh, Amrita's perspective. Uh, Amrita, Dr. Amrita Bari is an assistant professor of international trade law at ITAM, Mexico. She is the co chair professor for WTO chair program in Mexico and international consultant for trade and gender at the International Trade Center. So, Amrita, I know you have uh, a book on public private partnership for WTO dispute settlement. So it would be really interesting to listen to your perspective on this specific element that Valeria brought to us. So thinking about the different stakeholders involved uh, in a trade dispute, as mentioned by our colleague uh, Valeria, in your view, uh, what kind of partnerships can be formed for dispute avoidance? And what would be the key benefits of engaging industry in this process? Rita, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hanata. Um, yes, absolutely. As Valeria has mentioned, rightly mentioned, we need to somehow uh, reboot the system. And Valeria has, uh, to begin with, shown us six very useful ways to reboot the system. And I believe that uh, when, when Valeria mentioned about um, the, 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 the fifth and the sixth recommendation on changing the culture, perhaps changing the culture of member-driven and government-driven um, organization and, a, and introducing, cultivating a culture of cooperation, that's when my recommendation and my proposal comes in. Because perhaps one way to reboot the system is by building this few settlement avoidance capacity of countries through public-private partnerships. As we talk about rebooting and redesigning, it is perhaps time to think or rethink the role that private stakeholders, in particular industries, can play in this process. We know that the current environment wherein we are witnessing a growing disbelief in multilateral regulation will not allow for any changes in the norms and procedures because countries simply cannot arrive at a consensus nowadays. Hence, we need to try and find solutions at the domestic level. So the creation of dispute settlement partnerships to settle disagreements and disputes is really more of an in-house solution that would only require changes at the domestic level. So let me try and present this idea to you in two parts. First, what do I mean by these dispute settlement partnerships? And second, how can such partnerships help with dispute avoidance? So what are these partnerships all about? Every single trade dispute directly affects business interests. And take any dispute, for instance. In famous aircraft litigations, the countries fought these costly and time-intensive battles to restore the market access of their respective aircraft manufacturers. EU steel products is all about restoring the market access of steel industry. The alcoholic beverages cases are all about, were all about protecting the market access of one specific industry, the alcohol industry. Therefore, a commercial entity that wants to protect or expand its market access has the right reasons to provide its government with the relevant resources required for the removal of a trade barrier. The privately owned resources can be utilized by the government to investigate a barrier, 
raise specific trade concerns at committee meetings, launch bilateral negotiations, and even formal consultations, right? At stake during this arrangement are the private as well as the national interests. And then both stakeholders are mutually dependent on each other's resources for the protection of their respective interests. So it's a win-win game. It's a complete win-win game. And this proposed approach of trying to engage the industries, the private stakeholders in um, the pre-litigation phase for avoiding and preventing disputes is not about reinventing the wheel. I'm not proposing here to reinvent the wheel. We have already seen multiple formal and informal partnership arrangements wherein industries and governments have come together to settle disputes, to negotiate trade agreements, we just need to try and transport this idea, this model, this approach of partnership somehow to dispute avoidance. In several countries, such as Mexico and India, governments and industries have entered into informal ad hoc dialogues and exchange resources for preparing arguments, for gathering evidence to carry out formal consultations and actual litigations. And Brazil's approach is quite interesting as it has created dedicated standalone institutions and procedures to encourage these partnerships in the country. Countries like the US, the EU, China have gone all the way to formalize these partnership arrangements by creating laws, regulations that regulate these partnerships in these countries. And most of these partnerships so far have focused on litigating the dispute. As Valeria said, the culture is of litigation. So these partnerships have really been directed towards and they have been formed with the purpose of litigating. These partnerships have basically come into existence when a country has realized that, oh my God, we have a problem and we have to go through adjudication. So let's contact the industries who would probably bear or partly bear the cost or provide us the evidence because now it's our national repute at, at the cost that, you know. But that, that is not the right approach. This time is not right to go for litigation, as rightly pointed out. This crisis is detaining WTO members from filing formal disputes. So the real question is, can these partnerships help countries to settle disputes without going through litigation? Can we rethink somehow about using these partnership provisions, institutions, procedures, ad hoc arrangements, whatsoever they are, to help countries arrive at timely, cost-effective, and litigation-free settlements? The answer clearly is yes. But then, how can such partnerships help with dispute avoidance? Well, to prepare for informal or formal consultations, to represent or um, notify a concern, a specific trade concern at a committee meeting, the governments require a number of things. Commercial inputs, expert um, opinion, expert assistance, and so on and so forth. Industries can provide the right information and documents. They can provide the right commercial evidence. They can hire or even finance the hiring of experts, lawyers, finance experts, economists. And they can carry out the market research. Industries can monitor trade measures and identify trade barriers that impact their industry's market access. They are best placed to do that. And they can carry out a cost-benefit analysis to see if there is any point in pursuing this challenge further, in pursuing this case further. In these ways, they can help their governments answer the most fundamental questions that the countries need to answer at the pre-litigation dispute avoidance, dispute prevention stage. Does a given trade barrier vitiate the national interest and the overall economic well-being of the nation? What is the extent of its impact on the economic well-being of the nation or an industry? What are the chances of resolving this matter through informal negotiations or formal consultations? And what are the chances of winning at litigation and thereafter securing a compliance? How complicated is this case and how much resources are available within the government to prepare and if need be litigate the case? Is industry willing to support us? The government's team of lawyers and trade policy experts can interpret the legal norms from a legal perspective. But it is only the concerned industry which can analyze these legal norms from a commercial perspective and marshal out the required commercial facts, evidence, and arguments. 
So without this commercial input from the industry, the legal analysis and understanding remains in a vacuum, right? Basically to round up, this analysis and understanding is absolutely fundamental when a country notifies a specific trade concern, for instance, at a, at a WTO committee meeting, or starts to initiate an informal negotiation with the counterpart, because they need to understand the case legally and commercially. So a joint examination of trade barriers at the three litigation stage can help the countries, can help the governments in not only preparing a solid case, because that has happened so far, but it can also help in preparing the governments to settle conflicts, to avoid actual trade disputes and litigations right at the committee stage or right during informal negotiations, even before you get to formal consultations. Because I think when you get to, by the time you get to formal consultations, your mind is already made up. You're ready to start litigation. So, uh, and if you don't want to go through adjudication, then countries always have the option to get together and try and settle, resolve their matters via informal consultations, or they can notify and uh, have discussions and meet up and be in a room and engage and cooperate during committee um, committee discuss, uh, uh, discussions, right? Um, so that is my proposal, and I would love to hear your feedback and perhaps questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Lenita, for such uh, energetic participation. I know it's super early for you in Mexico, so thank you. Uh, you mentioned a lot about the specific trade concerns, pre-litigation work. So in this sense, I'd like to call uh, Mariana to join the conversation. Uh, Mariana Cartman has worked as a policy analyst at the o OECD Regulatory Policy Division focusing on international regulatory cooperation since February 2016. Previously, she held a position as policy advisor at the OECD, o OECD G820 Chairpa Office and conducted research at the Trade and Environment Division at the, of the WTO. I'm, I'm calling Mariana to join our conversation because Mariana has recently published a book entitled Transparency in the WTO, SPS and TBT agreements, the real jewel in the crowd. So, Rita and also Valeria actually mentioned a little bit about the work on, in the committees, TBT and SPS, specific trade concerns. So, considering uh, your experience, Mariana, on those topics, I would like to ask you to reflect on to what extent can non-judicial means of conflict management be used to prevent conflicts from rising from the status of formal disputes and for which cases in the dis is the dispute settlement body is still essential. Mariana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Renata, and uh, thank you very much also to Amrita and Valeria for, for your very uh, interesting and uh, thought-provoking uh, points. I, I really look forward to this discussion as well after, after um, all of our presentations, because there's really a lot to, um, to add on, on this topic, I find. So, Allow me also to underline my other area that I'm also speaking purely on my personal capacity, not, uh, not uh, on behalf of my institution. Now, uh, Renata, to answer the question, I'd like to contribute uh, today's uh, panel discussion by highlighting other ways in which conflicts can be and are, in fact, addressed under the realms of the WTO, other than through formal dispute settlement. Now, to begin, how can non-judicial means help prevent conflicts from rising to the status of formal disputes altogether? So how, how can conflicts actually be prevented altogether? Um, well, what I argue in my book, and, and here in front of you today is that the WTO already has very significant means of preventing trade conflicts from rising to the status of formal disputes thanks to transparency. Indeed, transparency enables dialogue both at the bilateral and multilateral le level among WTO members when issues about implementation of WTO uh, agreements arise with possible 
trade effects for other members. And discussing these issues at a very early stage before the trade effects escalate and while the potentially illegal situation can still be prevented or somehow repaired uh, is a crucial priority to manage trade disputes. The SPS and TBT agreements in particular are the two, two, uh, two ones that I've focused my studies on because, because for now they, they provide a very illustrative and, and significant uh, practice in this regard. From two, allow me to, to, to take two perspectives uh, on, on this. On one hand, uh, the two agreements require systematic notifications of domestic draft measures and very importantly, enable comments for these drafts from basically any WTO member and potentially anyone, even private parties worldwide. So in other words, any, um, any draft measure adopted by any country, any, any WTO member, so virtually mo uh, almost any country in the world, that has a significant impact on trade can be commented on by any other WTO member to try to work with this regulating state on a less trade restrictive option and, um, and potentially on, on reducing uh, any, any kind of illegal effect that it has. So there's still little evidence about the actual number of bilateral comments uh, that that take place because obviously this, this happens on a very informal uh, basis uh, as, uh, and, and purely bilaterally. But in terms of addressing tensions and preventing conflicts, it is very significant that this dialogue can already take place and is embedded in the spirit of these uh, WTO agreements, TBT and FD agreements. And coming back to what Valeria was talking about, this culture of cooperation, uh, it's th th this this already this bilateral dialogue is um, embedding this culture of cooperation in the very early stages of domestic rulemaking, and allows kind of to both contribute to better evidence building of domestic regulation, but also to foster kind of a collaborative implementation of the WTO agreement. So in the sense that. Um, with evidence provided by other members, uh, regulating uh, members of states can actually implement better their own obligations. And this collaborative implementation is further fostered uh, or, or kind of enabled by the WTO committees that, uh, that support the SPS and TBT agreements, in particular through uh, the, the specific trade concerns that Amrita was just mentioning. Uh, which, which basically um, are a way to elevate this bilateral dialogue to the multilateral level, allowing any member to raise a discussion in one of these two committees about a measure of another WTO member when it has a concern about its trade impact and or its consistency with WTO obligations, right? So via this, this SDC mechanism, the two committees allow members to exchange experiences and information about trade-related policies um, and to uh, address trade frictions, working towards a mutually acceptable solution in a non-judicial way. So just to give you a bit of numbers to show you how significant this practice already is, between 95 uh, when the WTO was established in 2018, there were 102 formal WTO disputes in which there is a SPS or a TBT claim. And in that same time period, there were 1,023 specific trade concerns raised in both the SBS and TBT committee together. So 10 times more issues were discussed in committee than informal disputes. Of course, many of these disputes discussed in committees are much more minor and don't deserve a full-fledged dispute. Uh, it's, uh, thankfully, there are not as many disputes and, and it's not always exactly the same type of issue that, that would anyway deserve a judicial procedure. But still, 
it's very significant to see that this is a very uh, a, a, a practice that is very used and uh, this collaborative nature of uh, of the this uh, this tool is very appreciated by by members and leveraged so again in the interest of time i won't go more into detail but you'll see um in, in my book that you kindly mentioned that 88% of specific trade concerns of the SBS committee, so uh, a, a large majority, and 53% and of SBCs in the TDT committee are can be presumed to be to be resolved, which means that basically because they haven't been raised again, because they've been raised once, discussed once or twice, and, and that members have either mentioned or notified to the secretariat or simply not discussed the matter anymore, we can uh, observe that there, the conflict no longer persists, showing that, again, this mechanism really allows to disentangle conflicts before they, before they escalate into formal disputes. And also, this dialogue is an obvious kind of prelude to the WTO dispute settlement in the sense that a majority of SPS and TDT disputes were first tried to be solved via these SDCs, uh, a clearly less costly and politically sensitive mechanism than raising a request for consultation. So, so there is kind of like a, a sequence uh, that starts with these um, with these SDCs before moving to a request for, for consultation. Now, going beyond the research in my book and the TBT and SBS remits, there's also a lot of evidence that shows that is gathered in particular by Bob Wolf from Queen's University, who shows that many other committees also offer the framework for raising such trade concerns, even though the practice is not formalized or, or as kind of systematic as in the SBS and TBT committees. He finds, for instance, that many major trade issues such as uh, Brexit or plain packaging or Huawei, which had significant kind of uh, impacts on trade and, 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 um, and posed, posed a lot of questions for, for different members, have been raised in different fora, um, in different WTO committees, such as the Market Access Committee, uh, or the Trade Related Investment Measures Committee, um, etc. And, and uh, so there is also a possibility uh, to extend this specific trade concerns practice beyond SPS and TDT. Now, another question is, um, for which cases is dispute settlement still essential? Despite highlighting that a number of issues can and are solved at the level of committees and of bilateral and, and multilateral dialogue, a few major disputes still persist and get raised in front of the dispute settlement body, likely because of high political stakes in the subject matters discussed, right? Uh, for, um, either because uh, th there's a lot of different interests involved or because the, uh, the stakes are very high, the economic stakes are very high. And so for such cases, it's of course absolutely essential that an independent third party can clarify the rights and obligations of WTO members by interpreting the texts of the agreement. So for instance, Australia plain packaging was an issue, uh, was a dispute which is uh, uh, very well known and sure all of you have followed the, uh, this dispute, and it was discussed in length in the TBT committee, accompanied by written statements to this committee accompanying these specific trade concerns, and also statements made in other WTO committees, such as trade-related aspects of uh, intellectual property rights council discussions, before formal requests for consultation were launched. So again, this, this is just an example of an issue that first was tried to be solved at the committee level, that there is kind of a lot of potential for, for uh, gathering all the parties uh, involved to uh, discuss on a more informal and perhaps less conflictual way 
possible ways of resolving uh, uh, an issue or a concern with uh, with a matter that's not uh, a measure uh, before it's fully implemented or before its um, effects are, are too harmful. And if the issue persists, well then, of course, a third party intervention uh, judicial uh, uh, panel is, is important. Um, now, of course, uh, just to finish up, it's undeniable uh, that um, the WTO dispute settlement body is a unique achievement of the WTO. I'm just going to highlight it again because I'm I'm pretty sure that nobody in our in our panel today um, is is um, disagrees that um, that the appellate body and more broadly the dispute settlement body are central fe features of the rule based multilateral system. But particularly now that there is a kind of a, a crisis undergoing this, this body, it's important to underline that the dispute settlement body is not alone in guaranteeing that WTO rules are implemented. So really to conclude, I'd like to underline that in rethinking dispute settlements or, or more broadly kind of the implementation of WTO obligations and the and the kind of guarantee of a fair multilateral rules-based system, it's important to see the WTO system as a whole, to, um, starting from the very drafting negotiations of WTO agreements, the so-called kind of upstream of international trade rulemaking to the implementation of these agreements or the downstream of rulemaking, and that throughout this, this entire cycle, the WTO has a variety of legal and institutional tools to guarantee the stability and fairness of the multilateral rules-based system. And uh, finally, just um, that thanks to these, these tools, the bilateral dialogue, but also the multilateral dialogue within the WTO committees, um, the 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 there is there's really much, much more that can be leveraged uh, to to support WTO members in um, in addressing their concerns with um, for, for the implementation of, of the uh, agreement. Excellent, Mariana. Actually, you made me think, um, uh, although I'm based in D.C. now, but I'm a Brazilian and I have been a trade lawyer for years in Brazil. And you made me think about the so many experience I had had with uh, the lack of awareness and knowledge from the private sector perspective. Uh, with regards to the utilization of transparency mechanism of STCs and in TBT and SPS committees. So I, I really think we need more work on this uh, also to the private sector so we can use that better uh, in our region. I, maybe Janiv will agree with me that there is not much knowledge in, in our region uh, with regards to those elements. So I'd like uh, now to introduce uh, Dr. Janine Remy to conclude this first round of questions. Before I introduce her, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box because after Janine uh, remarks, we are going to open up for questions and we have a gu guiding questions for you as well. So Dr. Janine Remy uh, currently serves as Deputy Director uh, of the Chirda Hamphal Center for International Trade Law, Policy and Services at the University of West Indies. Prior to her current position, Janine worked as a trade lawyer for five years and served for six years as a legal officer at the Appellate Body Secretariat of the WTO. So, Geneve, as somebody that has played uh, different roles with regards to the WTO dispute settlement system in and outside the WTO appellate body, what do you think could be changed in the dispute settlement system pillar to better solve the dispute? So, what, what could be changed in terms of procedures and stakeholders' engagement in order to maintain the relevance of the system for the years to come? Janine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Renato, and thanks to the uh, session conveners for inviting me to speak on this topic. Uh, 
um, I realize that we're stretched a little bit at the outer limits of time. So I'm going to try to make my comments as direct as possible. And I'm not going to be, unfortunately, as creative as my fellow co-panelists. Um, and I'll actually stay within the four corners of the existing system of dispute settlement that I believe has generated so much goodwill and reputational capital over the years, but which sadly um, has not delivered equally for all. Um, and I'm talking about disputes that cannot probably be broached or solved through the anti and avoidance transparency mechanisms that my co-panelists have stated. My opinions are more impressionistic than prescriptive and more practical oriented than academic. I think the debate that we are getting caught up in is processes and we're forgetting ultimately who or countries the system is really meant to serve. Um, a holistic approach which this panel is really aimed at uh, resuscitating has to be bottom up. And it has to start from a presumption that although not all are equally able, all are given as far as possible the tools and the international attention to participate in dispute settlement. That is what we ultimately need to strive for as an international body that has a diverse membership. We need to empower members and give them the tools and not create what is effectively an apartheid system that limits the access to dispute settlement to a few. So I want to start with what the system is. And that system has shown us over the years that there is a disparate performance. Um, and all of the disparate performances we see across different groupings from developed to developing and even within the cohort of developing from different types of interest, LDCs, small states, larger developing countries. The disparity in the performance cannot be explained only by low levels of trade. So for instance, if we look at small states, um, over the past 25 years, I can think of one case that a Caribbean country has brought and zero cases that the Pacific countries have brought. And I, I think Chad Brown said all the way in 2005, the size of exports at stake is an important determinant factor, but what really discourages participation in dispute settlement is a country's capacity to retaliate and ultimately its legal capacity. And that there is an institutional bias in the current rules that marginalize participation of all developing countries. Now, in fixing the broken system for some users, no one really wants to distract the conversation that's happening now with problems that are legacy problems about participation. We're all focused on fixing the problem so that the larger users can re-engage. The problem for me is that the fewer are happening now to fix the system is actually not solving the huge disparity in performance and participation of all, and is risking actually further marginalization of certain countries. And when we think of all of the proposals that are being put forward, including the MPIA, for instance, that system that is very likely to harden into a real uh, possible uh, sort of alternative is agnostic, both in its design and its implementation to development and developing country concerns. Some would say that we can actually improve the system by fixing, as I mentioned, the current ones. And so the Walker process is trying to bring certain countries, including the United States, back from the precipice into the fold. Um, some of the proposals so far have sought to uh, get rid of a two-tier system, which the appellate body uh, sort of sits at the top of and is no longer in use, and strengthen the panel system. Some of the proposals also think about when making the ACWL as a sort of an effective guarantor and representative of developing countries, strengthening that process. Uh, but that process of the ACWL for instance, itself 
doesn't allow all developing countries equal access to its resources based on a GDP per capita measure. And these things can be approached. But all of these processes, and this is the point, they really rely on political consent. And we know that the political consensus is taking some time to unfold and leadership and broader dynamics and trade wars ensures that we are not going to go anywhere with that process anytime soon. So what am I suggesting? How do we bring more countries to participate in dispute settlement? And how do we actually utilize the existing systems in the DSB and in the DSM to secure outcomes that are more empowering for all developing countries? I'm going to start with a controversial premise, which maybe is less controversial than I'm hoping which is that a one-size-fits-all approach does not work in dispute settlement. Um, the problem is that panels and the appellate body have become the adversarial method of choice. So everything else is tainted as a second-class option. They are also mandatory, and so they force and require all of the parties to engage in certain procedures. Um, as opposed to the voluntarism that is associated, I think Valeria, Valeria mentioned it with the ADR and the alternative dispute resolution system, such as good offices, conciliation, mediation, and ultimately arbitration. The few times as Hunter in a 2004, Hunter Nottage in a 2004, he said, is actually that they, these are key, there are key advantages to using these systems, including that it's more expeditious and for developing countries, it's likely to attract less fees. But of course, and the few times it has been used, it has actually been successful and led to successful outcomes. But the issue here is whether or not we can reconstruct the culture to believe that voluntarism in engaging in this settlement through these processes is actually a positive force because what it might do and what it does is that it engages the countries to see the process through. And I think the greatest chance of encouraging dispute settlements through these processes is where there are continuing pre-existing relationships between the parties that ultimately have to be maintained. So for instance, if you are engaged in an outside of the WTO forum, a Commonwealth Secretariat, for instance, being part of the Commonwealth Secretariat, or being engaged in an FTA with another country, it is in your interest to continue the utilization um, of the WTO to solve your disputes and continue that process using the arms and the tried and tested mechanisms of the WTO and bringing all the multilateral forces to bear on the dispute settlement at the WTO but nonetheless ensuring that your relationship with these countries exists and are secured even outside and beyond the WTO dispute. And so effectively what I'm suggesting is that the voluntarism of these features should be used as a basis for convergence and changing attitudes towards the enforceability of the outcome. And it, it builds on the pre-existing constructs and relationships and will be a different basis to engage. The reason why I would encourage use of these systems within the WTO and not go outside of it is that the WTO has amassed resources and as I mentioned, reputations in this field. There are existing resources that can be complemented by bringing in some outside features. The DSB remains a central battle-hardened mechanism to ensure implementation of outcomes. And there's a respectability factor associated with the WTO. So ultimately, what I'm suggesting is this. We do not need to think of ADR systems as all or nothing approaches or separate approaches. Instead, what we can think about is choosing these different ADR mechanisms as part of an a la carte voluntary mechanism that countries based on the configurations involved in the dispute, based on the size and the complexity, based on the timelines, based on pre-existing relationships that need to be nurtured and kept intact, is responsive 
to these needs. I think the MPIA shows, and this is the multi-party interim um, agreement system, that you can use Article 25 in a new way. It is not as an all or nothing in a sense, because what is being proposed by that is that you graft the MPIA template onto the existing WTO system. You have a panel process, you bring it to the MPIA system for the appeal, and then you put it back into the process for implementation under the DSB. I would actually prefer a more fluid process than what the MPIA is suggesting, which is that you use a fixed template. Yes, there is a provision for deviating from it, but you use a fixed template in order to kind of harden the rule. I think what we need is more specific uh, templates that are relevant to the specific dispute uh, that is being um, negotiated and ultimately being resolved. So what it would do is you would be creating these individualized templates depending on the configuration of countries involved. Maybe as Valeria was saying, you can not put in that template a mandatory consultation phase. Instead, you elect between the parties for a mediation phase. You can uh, retrofit your panel procedures without having, for instance, um, you know, two or three rounds of, of, of oral hearings. You can also choose the process for, uh, for, for uh, electing and nominating parties. You can also even think about implementation that would opt for compensation rather than retaliation, which small countries have not been able to use to effect. So compensation as part or ultimately of the way to get um, ultimate um, um, resolution of the dispute. So that's the first sort of broad-based suggestion that I'm making. The second one really is to think about the process for getting that overall approach adopted, which is, as we saw in the MPIA, it really started as an academic proposal that came out and was seized upon by the EU and then became more commonplace. I think to come up with this kind of proposal, relevant parties can approach an academic or even approach a temp uh, the, the, the creation of a template, shop it around, get the buy-in as an approach to solving disputes. And then the last thing that I would like to propose are new methods, new methods of democratizing dispute settlement through the use of online platforms. Um, the efforts at, tr at transparency that we're thinking about are, are really thinking about new ways of opening up dispute settlement to the public. And to the public, I mean allowing a greater cross-section of the dispute settlement community to participate from their capitals. I could think of cases where instead of having to go to Geneva and litigate a case, we can empower local law firms, we can empower capital-based legal departments to participate in disputes without having to hire the most expensive law firm in Geneva or in Washington that can actually um, you know, contemplate the cost of bringing cases. So ultimately, we have to use the technologies available to us and think about using that as a powerful tool to democratize dispute settlement. There are a number of other things that I can go into, but as time is not with us, I'll stop here and see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, um, Renat. Thank you so much, Janif. I think uh, you mentioned a lot of uh, elements and interesting points for discussion, actually. Uh, as we display the guiding question for, for the second part of the session, I would like to invite everybody again to type questions. I saw we have some. But as we display this guiding question, uh, and I give you some time to think about it, maybe I would like to... Um, give also some space for you to react to each other's um, question uh, remarks. And maybe, Valeria, if you could start, I have just the, um, um, maybe a first question for you, and I will also give you space to, to react to, to others' remarks. But you mentioned, Valeria, several times uh, uh, mediation as something that is not used enough, 
as uh, an instrument that we should uh, rely on um, more. So, uh, in your perspective, what kind of disputes are more amenable to mediation? Can you can you uh, build a little bit upon that? Like, what kind of disputes do you think are would be more amenable to be uh, to be solved through mediation or settled through mediation, Valeria? Thank you, Renata. I think that Janine can also uh, give her opinion on that. But um, I don't have a final answer to this question, right? And I'm, I'm going to be very brief here, just make some, some off-the-cuff uh, thoughts because I don't want to take time from the audience. But uh, well, mediation is, of course, uh, a less costly and a quicker way to solve disputes, right? So maybe it could be viable for, for um, small economies that cannot um, afford to pay extensive lawyers, but also for big economies. I I'm aware that some disputes are very difficult uh, to, to, to settle, let me, let's, let's say, to make a compromise. Um, there are disputes, for example, involving health policies. Um, so but e even in these cases, right, when you have health policies involved, I think that usually they complain it in these disputes. They don't question too much the legitimacy or, of the policy objective, but they question if, the, if, if, if it was proportionate, if the way to arrive at that policy objective was proportionate, right? So maybe this part of the dispute could be, could be subject to mediation. I don't know. This is just an, an, off, an off the cuff thought. Uh, and I think. There are also disputes that um, sometimes they, they concern a legal discussion on, on the correct interpretation of a specific provision, but behind that, what we have really is a political discussion, right? Some may think that this kind of disputes are not amenable to mediation. I'm not quite sure. I don't think that I quite agree. I'm not entirely sure that I agree with this, with this statement. In any case, I think that mediation could be used to reduce the scope uh, uh, for disagreement. And um, so I think um, maybe it could be used in every possible dispute. I uh, you know, Geneve, if you'd like to comment on that as well. Uh, and I would like just to read our guiding question and invite again everyone to type their thoughts on the, this guiding question. We would like this to be very interactive, this final minutes we have. So, Geneve, uh, thinking about mediation and thinking about uh, new or old procedures in new ways to prevent and settle disputes in the WTO, would you like to comment on that a little bit? And then, then I'll jump to, to Anita and Mariana. I, I don't have, actually have anything to add to what Valeria says. I agree. I think it's less about the types and the character of the disputes and more about the players. Um, ultimately, I think it should be one of the things that's available to them in the context of a dispute early on to replace, as I think Valeria was saying, consultations. It may be useful to have a third party in there, get some more sort of, um, I would say, effusive discussion that is relevant, um, rather than, you know, prescribing it for one type of dispute or another. I think it's just something that could lead to greater convergence and it can be used in place of consultations between the parties. Excellent. And um, maybe, Anita, if you could, you, you mentioned during your presentation um, the benefits of public-private uh, partnership uh, for WTO dispute settlement, but you didn't mention the eventual drawbacks of that solution, of that proposed solution. Would you like to, to um, Go a little bit deeper on that, on the drawbacks specifically. Thanks, Anata. Yes, sure. Um, so basically, I think in responding to this question, I would also try and touch upon one of the questions from um, uh, from the participants on uh, the deep level of trust between stakeholders. Um, of course, there are downsides of partnerships. We are talking about a public international law system. WTO dispute settlement is a public international law system. So when you allow these private stakeholders and private interests to come in and have a say, there are going to be problems. One of fundamental, one of the most, I think, um, uh, crucial um, uh, issue or a red flag in here 
could be a possible regulatory capture. Uh, any engagement or discussions, coordination between government and private stakeholders could result in um, private capture. And private capture um, usually would be harmful, especially in scenarios when there's a conflict of interest between the national interest and the specific private interest. A specific industry might have an interest which may not be in line with the overall national economic well-being of the country. So in these conflict of interest scenarios, if there is an instance of private capture during this public-private partnership, of course it give, gives in the way for discriminatory protection of interests between the industry and that is not in favor of the nation. Uh, this is one big drawback. Um, the other, uh, there are other drawbacks as well. But then I would say that, and, and, and this regulatory capture or private capture instances could also uh, create lack of trust. So perhaps the governments may not have the level of deep trust um, on the private stakeholders, which is required to form these partnerships, right? And how do we build upon? How do we go about managing this trust deficit, which you will mainly find in developing countries where there is poor observance of rule of law, there is more instances of corruption? Well, we need to, there are ways, we need to have the right established standalone procedures and institutions in place. We need to have uh, legal provisions wherein industries would know that they have a legal right to register or notify a trade concern or a trade barrier uh, within Ministry of Commerce or Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the government counterpart would have an obligation, a legal obligation to hear and register and preliminarily examine the viability of pursuing this measure. The other very important way of building this trust is to establish channels of communication, channels of information flow between the private and public stakeholders. And the last, um, I think, uh, way that really works to build upon this trust is if the industries are organized, if they're represented by trade associations or chambers of commerce who have previously coordinated and worked with the governments, because if you have repeat players coming to the governments and you the government officials know that you've worked with them before and it has worked all right, then there is a level of trust pre-established before a dispute or a disagreement initiates. So there are ways to come across and overcome the problem of lack of trust and even private capture. Private capture can be countered with regulatory measures, right? There are drawbacks, but there are solutions and countries have dealt with these solutions really well. Excellent, excellent, Rita. Uh, maybe I would like to connect uh, what you just said with uh, Mariana because I think it's uh, she she she's somebody that can react uh, to 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 your remarks and Maria and connect with uh, with uh, the the elements that she brought to the discussion. And actually, Mariana, if you can uh, also uh, answer, there there is actually a question for you in the chat box. So. I, and I think this might be the, a good moment for you to connect to your to your remarks. So uh, why why do the specific trade concerns, Mariana, cannot be expanded extended to to other committees? Uh, do you think there are difficulties in expanding this practice to other committees uh, beyond the SPS and CBT? So if you could comment on that as well, Mariana. Yes, hi. Thanks a lot, um, Renata. Sure. Just to begin on the um, on the um, I wanted to get back to what Amrita was saying about the importance of um, public private partnerships and also this uh, I just wanted to highlight that actually the, the the discussion with the private sector is really in my view one of the key uh, reasons for which there is a different um, obviously, a different um, uh, litigation uh, uh, practice across WTO members. So, why some members are more active than others? I think this can be very much explained by uh, by the active role of of the private sector uh, behind the scenes. And it's but it's a can also it's a very important uh, a determinant also of specific trade concerns that are raised because. Uh, in in um, in my research, I find that 
65% of all TDT um, uh, committee uh, uh, trade concerns actually were somehow originated from the private sector. And that's just through going through uh, minutes where the private sector is explicitly mentioned. So it's likely to be even more. Uh, and this, just to, to highlight how important it is to have some kind of um, guidance, harmonized practice on consulting and leveraging the inputs from the private sector on understanding trade impacts and negative trade impacts, et cetera, so that all members on a more kind of level playing field can uh, then raise more, uh, more equally uh, specific trade concerns and, and also disputes eventually if really necessary. Um, your second question was about why, um, uh, whether, whether specific trade concerns can be expanded to other committees. I believe, so um, the, my first uh, reaction is that the, the SPS and TBT committees have as I was explaining, it's very embedded to the, this culture of kind of dialogue and, and uh, discussion around draft measures that have a certain trade impact is very much embedded in the agreements themselves. And already, um, it's, that's why already since 1995, this, this practice has already progressively emerged and um, in, in these two committees. And it's very much also in the spirit of, um, of the subject matter of these two agreements, which is about regulate, regulatory matters, which, which precisely uh, are not the, the illegal nature of the, uh, of the measures is not clear cut. The, 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 there, there needs to be more kind of evidence, uh, a discussion of weighing of different interests to determine whether whether a measure is or not inconsistent with the legal obligations. So I think that's the reason for which it, the mechanism has particularly involved in these committees. But in my view, and as uh, I was pointing out to, to other research, there definitely is also some willingness for this to, um, from members to uh, engage in this practice in other committees. And uh, um, it, it, other committees also, uh, I believe, would, would really benefit from similar mechanisms, but may need a bit more a consideration uh, and, and uh, adapting of the rules of procedure, perhaps to a, 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 a certain extent uh, before, before it can be done. But I, I do think there's definitely opportunity and, and uh, definitely relevance to do so. Excellent. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, I would like to get some questions from, from, from the chat. And there is a, a first one um, mentioning a Robert, or Robert Lighthizer's article on how to set words, uh, word trade straight. In, the, in his article, he recommends the dismantling of the two-tier dispute resolution mechanism and have only one. What is the view of the, of the panelists on this? Maybe um, Arita, if you'd like to get that, and if others would like to react to that, I think that's an important, an important question. Thank you, thank you, Anata. Yes, I'm a firm believer of two-tier uh, system. I think a WTO dispute settlement mechanism is the only international adjudicatory mechanism in the world with a two-tier appellate authority and with binding and compulsory jurisdiction. There is no other international court with binding and compulsory jurisdiction and an appellate authority in addition to binding and compulsory jurisdiction. So what we have in there, as Jenny was saying a while ago, there is a wealth of understanding, there is a wealth of success in there. And we have seen that majority of the cases that have been litigated at the panel stage have gone to the appellate stage as well. So if the majority of cases have gone to the appellate stage, it means that members have seen using the appellate um, authority and the appellate stage um, as a very beneficial exercise. And the US itself, I think it is so contradictory in its action because the US is 
has dismantled, first of all, and completely killed off the appellate body. And now we have these articles and these pieces saying that perhaps the two-tier system doesn't work. Well, why did the U.S. appeal in the most recent the, 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 the panel report that was issued last week? Um, I think it was um, uh, the, the, the case that U.S. was fighting against China. The decision was given against the U.S., clearly, right? But why did it appeal? Why is it invoking the appellate body? It knows that it has killed the appellate body. It is a perfect evidence and a perfect example of having malafide intentions, bad intentions, right? So members have shown their complete faith and trust in the appellate body system. There are problems. Um, I remember one of the chats, uh, one of the presentations of Arancha Gonzalez. In there, she said um, that uh, if the house is old or slightly moving, uh, falling apart, you repair it unless you want to build a new building. You don't completely demolish it, right? So there are repairs to be done, but they can be done easily. And we know that there are repairs to be done. It doesn't mean that we demolish it. It's the only international organization or international adjudication mechanism in the world we have with this kind of power. So let's not lose it. It'll be a shame to kill it off. Valeria, would you like to make a comment on that as well? I'll, I just would like to warn you that we have uh, around 10 minutes. So, Ian, we have two more questions to answer, okay? So, I'll be very brief. Um, Renata, I really don't think that dismantling the two-tier dispute resolution mechanism is feasible, right? Because I think the majority of countries value and want to have a two-tier uh, dispute resolution mechanism. So I don't really, really think that this is a viable, a viable way forward. Can I just add something to that, which is that I, I think in the current climate, it's very unlikely, again, as that was the, 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 the sort of the predicates of my remarks, it's very unlikely that anything is going to change significantly unless the major players all come on board and have the same approach, or at least are willing to converge on a direction forward. I think whether we should have a two-tier or single-tier system is at this point academic. I think the MPIA provides a forum and an avenue for those who want to um, to have a, a, a recourse for a two-tier system. I think what we are seeing, just as we are in the plurilateral negotiations, is a a la carte approach to dispute settlement. I think we are entering a phase where nothing is one size fits all. Everything is subject to negotiation and everything is subject to what the countries that are involved in the specific um, uh, issue at hand, in this case, a specific dispute, how they choose or how they want to proceed. The problem, all, obviously, is that we have an existing DSU text. And the existing DSU text represents some kind of compromise that was achieved at the beginning and allocates rights and obligations and expectations that countries have, have negotiated. So if you are going to remove the appellate structure, which was part of the negotiated solution, you're actually upsetting the apple cart. You're upsetting the balance of negotiation outcomes. And I think that is going to require a rethinking and a resetting of how you approach it. So for instance, countries that, um, like mine, like smaller ones, that really rely on the rule of law, the appellate body is is really the hallmark of that. How are we now going to approach a situation where you really have the panel as the last stand? Are you going to then go into other areas like more um, dispute settlements, voluntary um, solutions, et cetera, et cetera? I think it's more than just a question of will we have the appellate body or will we not have the appellate body? And I think it's really going to be that we're entering into a phase of countries picking and choosing the parts of the dispute settlement system that they like, the parts that are going to be relevant to their specific disputes, and ultimately it's going to be a fragmentation of dispute settlement, just as we're seeing in the negotiating function. And that's the reality we're facing. Unless somebody, a new director general or some new leadership at, at the level of the, po the politics is going to change the culture that we're, we're in and wanting to forge us towards some sort of solution. I see that we have a transparency question. If I can just add one thing to that um, as, a as a precursor to, I'm sure, um, Mariana um, tackling that question is, I'm a little bit cautious, I'll be, I will be honest, about thinking of transparency as 
an alternative to dispute settlement because it also engages resources. It engages resources of the smaller developing countries, not just the smaller, but developing countries. And if we are to go by some of the reform proposals, which is not just increasing notification, but attaching a sanction for the absence of notification, you further marginalizing countries that cannot on their current resource base um, actually notify in a way that will lead to what we're intending, which is more transparency. So what I wouldn't want to see is that we approach this, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure this is not what the panel uh, is saying, but we think of transparency as a stand-in for dispute settlement, and that we empower the transparency mechanism and take on board all of the other things that may come with that, which is that you're putting more pressure on countries to notify and use that counter notification process as some way of conflict avoidance in a way that will give even more um, a sort of um, uh, resources, need more resources from the countries that currently cannot meet their notification um, requirements under the current system. Excellent. Mariana, would you like to comment on the question on tr of transparency? Um, yes, sure. Um, so I see that there, the question is whether uh, the current uh, skepticism about multilateralism will make it more difficult to push for an expansion in transparency and, and whether countries will be more kind of uh, reluctant to report in draft measures. Um, in reaction to that, I would, my, uh, in theory, I, I would, I, I see how that may be, may be a temptation, but in practice, I, the, the number of different proposals that have been made and the discussions that have been going on, whether in the Council of Trading Goods or whether in, in many different WTO committees about precisely increasing transparency, uh, and many of these proposals being supported by different members of different levels of development, whether um, uh, go, going uh, all the way from United States to Canada to the, to uh, many many different um, countries, have uh, Brazil, uh, etc. Off the top of my head. Um, the, I, the, the evidence seems to indicate that there's not a move away from transparency, that on the contrary, there seems to be more support for this type of less, uh, less judicial, less um, burdensome uh, and political uh, conflictual uh, approaches towards more, more technical discussions that allow for a more, uh, uh, more uh, less conflictual way to, to resolving trade issues. Uh, of course, uh, reporting of draft measures is always, uh, can always be a bit of a sensitive question. Some, um, and this is why in certain committees, uh, countries are particularly reluctant to notify their measures because it, it may be a way of kind of self-incriminating themselves. Um, but I think that in, in the case of measures such as CDP or SPS, where, where the uh, measures that are notified are not, there's no kind of black or white of what is 100% illegal or not, uh, there's, there's a, it's still, it's still always beneficial for the country notified to receive in. Uh, uh, inputs from other countries. There may, of course, be some bad faith, some countries, and there will always be uh, certainly countries not notifying because they don't want to draw attention to something. But I don't see this as being a very uh, a general tendency these days. 
Excellent, Mariana. We have exactly four minutes, so I'd like to give one minute for each of you to, for final remarks. And I'll read the last question here if you would like to address that question uh, within your final remarks. It's, it would be great. Uh, the question is, I'd like to ask a question uh, to the panelists. If in the absence of public body, do you think that MPIA can play an effective role despite having a plurilateral representation and entering a Arrangement. So I would like to go. Maybe who would like to go first? Can we go round? I can. Valeria, I can go first. Yes. Okay. So I just, I just want in my final remarks. I think I, I just want to to stress that the dispute settlement function has really to be thought in a holistic manner, in a broader manner, in an integrated manner. Okay. All actors have a shared responsibility in having a dispute settlement mechanism that functions. All, all actors. And I think that all tools that we have, we already have in the WTO, should be better used in order to achieve that purpose. So that's all. Rita? Yes. So I think we have all agreed and we have all uh, been in line with um, uh, our arguments that we need to reboot the system. We need to rethink it. And we have all um, tried to um, uh, have a single line of position, which is that it is important now to rethink it somehow in a way that we start using the existing procedures and stakeholders we have in place in the system. Whether MPIA can replace the appellate body? No. Whether it is um, a useful mechanism to have when the appellate body is not functioning? Yes. But let's not lose sight of the fact that it's a stop gap mechanism. It's a temporary mechanism. And we have had a very um, famous history of having these stop gap and temporary mechanisms, for example, GAT 1947. Um, laying around forever, right? So we need to not lose uh, sight of the fact that this is an interim arrangement and we need to restore and revive the appellate body once again. And we also need to think about the dispute settlement mechanism in a holistic manner, uh -huh. in an integrated manner, engaging the right stakeholders and using the right procedures. Deneve and Mariana, we have one minute left, so very hard. <laughs> Deneve? Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, it's been a pleasure being on this panel with these ladies. I think there is a real risk that the MPIA will harden and, and concretize into something more permanent in the absence of um, a political um, sort of impact not, not clearing. I think that it is going to represent the further cannibalization and fragmentation of dispute settlements which smaller developing countries need to find a way to situate themselves in that and begin to actively utilize the system in a way that is going to be beneficial to them. And I think the approach is to voluntary types um, of arrangements that um, rely on pre-existing relationships being kept intact and utilizing the framework um, and the overall architecture of the DSB to make sure that the dispute settlement does not become irrelevant at the WTO and people start going outside of the WTO to settle disputes. So I don't think the answer is necessarily removing focus to other bodies. I think these are complements, but I think we need to fix dispute settlements in a way that delivers for all, all countries develop, developing. Thank you. Thank you, Geneve. Mariana, please, organization, give us one minute more. <laughs> yes, thanks. I think I've, I've spoken enough today, but I just want to highlight that, yes, fixing the dispute settlement body is an absolute priority. I mean, it's a very important uh, thing to do. The dispute settlement body is essential for the WTO and the two-tier system as well. But um, still, uh, to do so and to, to have the multi-level rules-based system really functioning, I think the holistic approach that we've we've been discussing today is really essential. And uh, uh, dispute settlement is one fraction of the whole image. Transparency is the real jewel of the crown. Um, thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you everyone who participated uh, and stayed with us until now. Thank you, ladies. Uh, our four panelists are amazing.
Uh, thank you so much and thank you the Geneva Trade Week for giving some space for us to share our thoughts on dispute settlement. Thank you very much.